he would call a local number and it would ring no matter where I was in the world, mm. which was not a novelty back then. It never went back. I went back two years later when things had settled down. quieted down a little bit. But that was a close one. I had a closer one a year later, but that was that was the first. What was, was the closer one a year later? Where was that? That was in a Middle Eastern country that okay. the CIA won't allow me to name. Pre-9-11. Yes, pre-9-11. Weeks pre-9-11. So I had a buddy who was a station chief there. And we just really, really loved each other. Just an all around good guy. And actually, he's the one who introduced me to my second wife. Hmm. And um, he calls me. He said, buddy, I got, a, I got a favor to ask. I said, sure, name it. He goes, we're running a double agent case out here. And the guy's just too dangerous for my people to meet with on a regular basis. He insists on speaking to the chief. And I just can't risk meeting with him. Can you come out here? and pretend to be me and handle a double agent. I had never handled a double agent before, but I had gone through the training and I said, done. So I get on the plane, fly to the Middle East. And he says, here's the story. Um, we recruited this guy and he was a, an engineer and a contractor for a major American defense contractor. The contractor did not know that he had also been recruited by one of America's greatest enemies. Mm. Okay. And they had directed him to allow himself to be recruited by the CIA so that he could report back to them as a double agent. Oh, this is getting deep. So he didn't know that we knew that he was a double agent. So he was a double, double agent. Uh huh. It gets complicated. Yeah. So... I go out there and I trigger the meeting and we meet at this obscure hotel in and I'm wearing a jacket. Do we have to bleep that? Oh, shit. Yes. Yeah. Make a mark of that. Sorry. Yeah. Let's bleep that. He said it. Yeah. We, we can't forget that. We'll put the. Thank you. Yeah, I'll we, never forget that. <laughs> yeah. We got you. <laughs> We got you. You wouldn't Sorry. have known. No, you're good. You're good. I, I spoke right through it. That's that's why we do it. So you meet with this guy so in I meet an with undisclosed this guy location. At an, at an undisclosed hotel. And uh, I was wearing a jacket. I took off my jacket so he could see I was not armed. And I said, listen, since this is our first meeting, we need to talk about some of the basics. I said, the first thing we're going to do every time we see each other is something that we call the mad minute at the CIA. So I ask you, are you safe? Were you followed here? Did you do a surveillance detection route? And we make plans for the next meeting. So if somebody busts down the door, we've at least gotten the, the important stuff out of the way. He said, well, what happens if it, they do bust down the door? I said, we have to have a cover story. We can say we went to the same university. Let's do that. Okay, where did you go to school? He said whatever school he went to. And I said, okay, that's where I went to. And I came to... Oh, fuck. Sorry. Sorry. It's all good. Clip it. We got it again. So I, I came to this country <laughs> and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> just make sure on those, Alessi, just flip the camera to me in the post edit when he's saying it and, and he'll bleep it out. We're good. I'm sorry. It, ha it happens all the time. With you, with you spooky guys. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So I came to this country, we ran into each other, we decided to hang out, that's it. Okay, that's our cover story. And I said, next thing we, we have to do is, I want you to go out and get a post office box. So if there's some reason why we can't speak on the phone, I'll be able to message you through the post office box and I want you to go there and check for mail once a week. He said, okay, we will do. So we made plans for our next meeting and I said to him, most importantly, you need to do a surveillance detection route to our meeting and home from our meeting. Do you know what a surveillance detection route is? He says, I think so. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to go from, let's say, your house to point A. And at point A, let's say you pick up your dry cleaning. 
And then you go to the second stop and you buy a light bulb. And then you go to the third stop and you buy some pastries and you make sure you're not being followed. And then you can come to the meeting. But once you finish the second stop, get off the main roads and then use lesser used roads. And then from the final stop to the hotel, just take some crazy way that doesn't make any sense. Mm. He said, great. So he said to me, just so I can be sure. So you're the chief. And I said, I'm the chief. He said, nobody higher than you. I said, you got the boss, Duke. I'm the chief. So I said, I'm going to give you my phone number. I had what back then, and we're talking about, you know, 23, 24 years ago, 23 years ago, it was called a tri-band cell phone. So it was good in every country in the world. We bought it in that country and it acted as a satellite phone. So he would call a local number and it would ring no matter where I was in the world, hmm. which was not a novelty back then. But he wouldn't have any idea if I was in that country or if I was, you know, somewhere else. Got it. So I pretended to live there. And um, what name did you give him? You have like a fake name? Oh, yeah. You always use a fake name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually used my colleague's real name because remember, I was supposed to be him. And he's on and the. And he used his real name. And he was on the diplomatic list. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. So this went on for months. I would meet him. I would meet him every few weeks. We would always meet at different hotels, different locations. And I would get a little deeper and deeper and deeper in my conversations with him. What kinds of things were you trying to get from him without going into classified details? Um, he was a member of a minority sect and he had friends and relatives who were active members of a terrorist group that, mm. that, that sect kind of adheres to. Hmm. And so I wanted that. Got it. So, so he would never, ever, ever do surveillance detection routes. He would get in his car, drive directly from his house to the hotel. And we have like four teams of guys on him and he would never see any of them. And then he would leave our meeting and go directly to this enemy country's embassy directly without stopping no turns no surveillance nothing and we got teams on him and on top of that we're on his phone because i said let's exchange phone numbers okay so now we have his phone too yeah so this went on for about six months and um i happen to be in washington and i get this hair on fire cable from the embassy from, from my colleague. And he says, they're on to you. And I said, how? He said, well, actually it's my fault. He said, they're, they're on to me. He said, they were in the hotel lobby last time and they got a picture of you. And they said, we know who the chief is and that ain't him. Mm. I said, okay. So we, we take it somewhere else. We take it to a neighboring country, the next meeting. He said, no, dude, They've ordered him to kill you in the next meeting. I said, get the fuck out of here. I said, this guy's afraid of his own shadow. He's not going to kill me in the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like that guy in, in Greece now. Seriously. They never shoot through oh, my armored on. car. So I'm at headquarters and they're like, operation's over. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's not be hasty here. <laughs> <laughs> you send me back in, God damn it. We can seriously disrupt this group, like seriously dismantle it. So I said, hear me out. There's a Marriott in this country, okay? Every Marriott is designed in exactly the same way. As soon as you walk in, the bathroom's on the right, right? Really? As soon as you walk thing? into your room, yeah. As soon as you walk into the room, the bathroom's on the right. Interesting. I said, how about this? We tell him that the meeting's at a Marriott. We get adjoining rooms. Our foreign intelligence liaison comrades and our guys are in the neighboring room. I'll prop the door open with the, that security lock. Yeah. Tell him where to come and 
what room I'm in for the meeting. When he comes in, I take him down because I'm going to be in the bathroom. I come right out of the bathroom, take him down. You guys bust in from the next uh, door, the next room, and we got him. They're like, I don't know. It's risky. I said, I'll, I'll wear a vest. How about that? Under my, under my shirt, I'll wear a vest. Okay, they agree to it. So it got, it got unfriendly. So I go out there and we have like six guys in the lobby. Well, the bad guys have six guys in the lobby. Oh, and, shit. And our guys are looking at their guys. Everybody's armed. They all know too. They all know. Like, this is the day that they kill me. So I'm up in the room and my guy's calling me saying, you wouldn't fucking believe what the lobby is like right now. <laughs> he got a gun. Yep. He got a gun. Yeah. And so, everybody got so guns. So do we. So they text me, he's coming in right now. So he, the source calls me. Do you have chloroform? <laughs> no. No? Well, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. No, we had Demerol injectable. Yeah, it works. So um, he calls me. Said, I, "I'm here. I'm in the lobby." I said, uh, "Come up to the uh, come up to the eighth floor." So he comes up to the eighth floor, and I'm there in the elevator lobby. And I give him this big bear hug, and I pat him down. And he's nervous, really nervous. And I said, "Come, come with me. Come on. We're gonna we're gonna walk. We're gonna go to the stairwell." So we go to the stairwell. Well, the eighth floor was the top floor. And I go, uh, we're going to meet on the roof today. He's like, what? I said, we're going to meet on the roof. No, I'm not going to go on the roof. I said, sure you are. Come on, let's go. We're going to go up the roof. <laughs> He's like, no. I go, yeah. Up. <laughs> he gets nervous to the point where I think he's going to start crying. And I said, what's going on? I thought we were friends. I'm not going to the roof, he says. And I said, oh, yes, you are. So I push him to go upstairs and he starts to cry. I said, what is your problem? He said, I don't want to go to the roof. I said, all right. He thought you were going to see if he could fly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he thought. So I said, all right, go to the fourth floor and call me from there. He goes down to the fourth floor. I go back to the room, which is on six. And he calls me. He said, I'm on the fourth floor. I said, come to 612. So he takes the elevator, comes to 612, knocks on the door. I say, come in. He walks in. I come out of the bathroom. I bear hug him. I take him down to the ground. Our guys and the and the liaison guys bust in from the other side and I'm sitting on him. I have him pinned. And I said to him, do you think I am so fucking stupid that I don't know that you came here to kill me today? Do you think I am such a fucking amateur that I don't know exactly who you are and what you came here today to do? He goes, fuck you. Like that. He goes... Fuck you, I'm not afraid of you. I said, no, but you're going to be plenty afraid of my friends. Uh-huh. And then, bang, they give him the Demerol. the uh, Demerol. He's out. Well, listen, one of the dirty little secrets of the hotel industry is that people die in hotels every single day. Mm -hmm. Right? So we put him on a gurney. We cover him up. We take him out the back door into an ambulance and drive away. In the meantime... Right to Guantanamo? No. <laughs> no. He probably wished he was in Guantanamo after what he got. Yeah. I'm getting text messages from, uh, from my buddies in the lobby. Like, these guys are starting to freak out. And they're speaking in their language. Like, where is he? It should, it should have been done by now. Why hasn't he checked in? What's going on? They're Some saying that blatantly, mm -hmm. even though they know your six guys are there? In their, in their language. So they don't think our guys speak their unusual language. The chances that yeah, one out of I six... I know, right? Uh, come on. Stupid. Yeah. Stupid idiots. Amateur hour. Yeah. We take him to the intelligence service headquarters. And when he wakes up, he's tied to a chair. Oh. So I'm standing there and I said, buddy, this can be easy 
or it can be terrible. <laughs> you hit him with the Abu Zubaydah line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, where are the weapons? <laughs> Fuck you. I'll never tell you anything. I said, if you want to live, you're going to tell me where the weapons are. I'm not talking. Our colleagues beat the living snot out of him, and he just would not talk. So I said, or one of the liaison guys said, we need to get into his house. And I said, okay, I know where he lives, but he's got a Filipino maid and she never leaves the house. And they're like, oh, then we can't go in the house because this has to be totally secret. So I said, well, let's just say there's a, we'll say there's a gas leak and we'll, we'll evacuate everybody. And he's like, we don't have gas lines in this country. We use propane. I go, okay, well, then let's just bring a big 18-wheeler full of propane and, and we'll spill it on the ground and we'll declare an environmental disaster. And so an hour later, there's this 18-wheeler driving down a road and we pull in front of his house. There's this big wheel on the back and I'm going like this and this propane spilling all over the ground. <laughs> and we're like, oh, it's an environmental uh, emergency. And we close the propane and then um, we evacuate. It was like six houses on a cul-de-sac. We evacuate all the six houses. So we go into his house. And he's got a safe, a big safe in the house. And I was like, this is it. It's the weapons. So we have a locks and picks team on standby. So they come 20 minutes or so it takes them to, uh, to finally pop the lock. And it's empty except for a map. There's a map. And it's got an X, like, the weapons are here, <laughs> X. I'm serious. It was nuts. Were so, you looking for biological weapons? <laughs> no, just weapons, weapons. Okay. So it's about 25 miles south of where we were, and it was out in the desert. So we, we go down there, and, and there's a bunker just dug in, a, in the ground. And all of the weapons are in there, like enough for a small army. Whoa. So we confiscated them. Our partners destroyed them. He was uh, convicted of, of uh, terrorism and given a life sentence. And uh, our enemies were none the wiser. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.